Hi guys, so topic for today is a Meniere's disease. So the introduction, as you can see, this is a diagram of the ear, this outer, inner and the middle ear. So the anatomy of the inner ear, the inner ear or the labyrinth is an important organ of hearing and balance. It consists of the membranous labyrinth and the bony labyrinth. So this is a diagram of the inner ear, the bony labyrinth. So this is the cochlea. This is the cochlea. These are the three semicircular canals. This is the vestibule. So this area, this is the vestibule. These three are the semicircular canals. And yes, this is the cochlea. This is the vestibule and these are the three semicircular canals. This is the anterior, this is the posterior and the lateral semicircular canal. This is the common bony limb. Uh, this is the oval window. Uh, this is the round window. This is the vestibule. This area is the vestibule. This is the cochlea and the turns. Now here is the cochlear duct. Here you can see this is the cochlear duct. This is the ductus reunions. The saccule, the utricle. This is the endolymphatic sac. These are the three semicircular canals. The ducts in these are the three canals, and you can see the ducts inside the canal. So, what is this line inside this duct? This is the organ of corti. This is the organ of corti. This is the macula of the saccule, the macula of the utricle. These are the crista of the crista ampullaris of the anterior semicircular ducts, similarly for the lateral and the posterior. So this is the cochlear, this is the cochlear labyrinth, and this is the vestibular labyrinth. So again, this is the bony cochlea. You can see here. You can see the auditory nerve, the cochlea. This is the oval window where the steps foot plate attaches, and these are the three semicircular canals. So the bony cochlea, what it has three components: the scala vestibuli, the scala media, and the scala tympani. So in this diagram, we can see the uppermost is the scala vestibuli. The scala vestibuli. The lowermost is the scala tympani, and in the center lies the scala media. So, what is this? The organ of corti. Here you can see the spiral ganglions. This is the osseous spiral lamina. One need to understand that the inner hair cell lie on the osseous spiral lamina. And where is the outer hair cells? These are outer hair cells. This line on the basilar membrane. This is a tectorial membrane. Tectorial membrane. And this is the osseous labyrinth wall. The spiral ligament and the spiral ganglion. Don't confuse. And this is the Reisner's membrane. Reisner's membrane. Moving on, again here, this is the microscopic, uh, electron microscopic picture you can see. So what you can see here, the recess membrane, the tectorial, the inner hair cells, the outer hair cells, the inner hair cells lying over the oceans, and this is the outer hair cells lying over the basilar membrane 
Now here you can see this is the steps foot plate lying over the oval window. This is the scalar vestibuli, the sound, the sound coming from the outer ear, then the traveling through the middle ear goes to the inner ear through the steps foot plate. And this is the helicotremor. So sound waves basically come from the external ear that it travels to the middle ear. There is os the ossicle moves, then it uh, the sound is traveled from, from the middle ear to the inner ear. There is a movement of this fluid inside this uh, inner ear. Now comes the membranous labyrinth. It consists of the cochlear duct, the utricle, saccule, three semicircular ducts, and the endolymphatic sac and duct. So here you can see that membranous, membranous labyrinth consists of the cochlear duct, utricle, saccule, three semicircular ducts, and the endolymphatic duct and sac. So what is the organ of corti? I have uh, discussed pre previously, I have told you all the anatomical uh, landmarks. So it is a sense organ of hearing and is situated on the basilar membrane. It components of the organ of corti are the tunnel of the corti, the hair cells, the supporting cells and the tectorial membrane. So here you can see the tectorial membrane, the tunnel, the basilar membrane and the outer and the inner hair cells. Again, you can see this is a tectorial membrane, the basilar membrane, the outer hair cells, the inner hair cells, the tunnel, and this inner hair cells lying over the osseous spiral lamina and the outer hair cells lying over the basilar membrane. So let's talk about the vertigo. What, what is vertigo? Vertigo is a feeling that you or your environment is moving or spinning. So what are the causes of the vertigo? Well, the causes of the vertigo can be various. They can be labyrinthitis, there can be vestibular neuronitis, benign proximal positional vertigo, head injury, migraines, menial disease, acoustic neuroma. So what is menial disease? In 1861, Prosper Menias described a syndrome characterized by the deafness, stintus, and the episodic vertigo. He linked this condition to a disorder of the inner ear. So in 1938, Halpai Ken Krenz described the underlying pathology of the menial disease as the being the endolymphatic hydrops. So what is the age distribution and the incidence of the disease? In the US, 50% of the patients have a positive family history. So the estimated prevalence is 150 cases per 1 lakh population and 40s and 50s are mostly involved and women are mostly more commonly involved than males. So what are the possible causes? If you see the anatomical abnormalities, the genetic autosomal dominant, the immunological, the immune complex deposition, the viral serum Ig to the herpes simplex virus type 1 and type 2, Epstein Barr virus and cytomegalovirus, virus, uh, vascular associated with the migraines, and the metabolic potassium intoxication. The pathophysiology the theories behind, behind the endolymphatic dihydrops is the alteration, the absorption of the endolymph and alteration in the production of the endolymph. Either there is a alteration in the absorption, the endolymph which is produ being produced is not getting absorbed or the production of the endolymph, it is produ getting produced more. So what is the pathophysiology? The endolymphatic hydrops is a swelling of one of the tiny fluid filled compartments of the inner ear. We know that the inner ear have uh, different compartments and the fluid lies in between them. So in a normal inner ear, the fluid is maintained at a constant volume and contains a specific concentration of sodium, potassium, chloride and other electrolytes. This fluid bathes the sensory cells of the inner ear and allows them to function normally. With injury or degeneration of the inner ear structures, independent control may be lost. And the volume and the concentration of the inner ear fluid fluctuates, which changes the uh, uh, body's fluid and blood. This fluctuation causes the symptoms of the hydrops. Here you can see there's a normal membranous labyrinth. Now you can see this is dilated because the fluid is filled. There's a problem with the absorption or there is overproduction. So dilated membranous labyrinth is there. So what are the symptoms? This is the C. The symptoms are very easy to remember. We can remember by the DVT. Deafness, V for vertigo and T for tinnitus. 
periodic episodes of the rotatory vertigo, fluctuating progressive low frequency hearing loss and tinnitus or fullness and pressure we can see. Here is a diagram see venous disease, tinnitus, deafness, vertigo, main. So what is the classification? Well, it is classified as a, uh, either as a positive, how we can classify it according to the symptoms like possible meniere disease, it is a probable meniere disease, definitive or certain meniere disease. So if the episodic vertigo of the meniere type without documenting hearing loss, there is episodic vertigo, but there is no documented hearing loss, then we can say it is a possible meniere disease. If there is one definite episode of the vertigo, and automatically documented hearing loss on at least one occasion and tinnitus is present or oral fullness is there then we can say this is probable because there is only one definitive episode of vertigo so that is a probable meniere disease if there are two or more definite spontaneous episodes of vertigo which is lasting for 20 minutes or longer and automatically documented hearing loss on at least one occasion and tinnitus and oral fullness is present then it is a definitive meniere disease and third is a certain meniere disease and third is certain meniere disease all what is present in the definite meniere disease with a histopathological confirmation then it is a certain meniere disease then comes a the staging when the staging uh, the automatically uh, proven uh, hearing loss if uh, stage 1 there is a less than 25 PTA 2 26 to 40 3 is a 41 to 70 and 4 is a greater than 70 So what is the diagnosis a diagnosis of meniere disease is based made based on a careful history physical examination lab investigations audiometry electrocochlography and the electronystagmography In history the most important part of the diagnosis is the pattern of the symptoms associated between the hearing loss status and the vertigo three main system uh, symptoms are the dvt deafness v for vertigo t for tinnitus so physical examination the examination results vary depend upon the phase of the disease during remission the physical examination findings may be completely normal particularly in a patient is symptom free so during an acute attack the patient has a severe vertigo Vital signs may show elevated blood pressure, pulse and respiration. Turing fog test. The Weber Turing fog test usually lateralizes away from the affected ear. The Rini's test usually uh, indicates that the air conduction remains better than the bone conduction. So AC is greater than BC and the Weber's is lateralized away from the affected ear. Well, the physical examination spontaneous nystagmus is directed towards the affected ear. It's typical during an acute attack. The Rombox tests generally show a significant instability and worsening when the eyes are closed. Serious examination, the complete neurologic evaluation is important. New onset vertigo might be an early sign of stroke, migraine or a brainstem compression that may require emergent evaluation and care. Lab studies, no lab studies are specific for the meniere disease. A CB, urinalysis, and alcohol and drug screening may be helpful for other causes considered. Well, the imaging study is the magnetic resonance uh, imaging and the CD scans can be done. Audiometry that typically the lower frequencies are affected more severely. This is due to the preferential sensitivity of the apex to the high drops. The transtympanic electrocochleography. The transtympanic electrocochleography specifically detects the distortion of the neural membranes of the inner ear. This is presumably due to the dependent lymph pressure fluctuations and can show the evidence of the cochlear involvement. This is most accurate when the meniere is active. Well, the differential diagnosis is broad and includes the perilymph fistula, recurrent labyrinthitis, Otosclerosis, migraine, viral meningitis, viral encephalitis, neurosyphilis, stroke, tumor, trauma, autoimmune disorders. Well, if talk about treatment, treatment of the acute attack, treatment of the chronic phase and surgical treatments, three broad categories. So in the acute attack, the insurance and the bed rest is advised. 
the vestibular suppressants are given like the maclizine and the prochlorpyrazine which decreases the symptoms but generally only masks the what i go by decreasing the brain response to the vestibular inputs so maclizine and prochlorpyrazine can be given diazepam basically acts as a vestibular depressant and also alleviates the anxiety and associated with the disorder so usual doses is 5 mg administered only every 3 hours the initial dose may also be administered intravenously well we talk about the diuretics the hydro uh, this hydrochlorothiazide actually decreases the fluid pressure load in the inner ear these medications help prevent attacks but do not help worse an acute attack has started vasodilator like the histamine drip inhalation of the carbonogen the 5% carbon dioxide and 95% oxygen the steroids anti-inflammatory properties of the steroids are helpful in the endolymphatic side drops this is probably due to the reduced endolymphatic pressure and steroid actually causes can reverse the vertigo tendency and hearing loss well the, about the chronic phase the lifestyle changes so during the quinsin phase the lifestyle and dietary changes are usually the first step avoiding the trigger substance like caffeine also may be sufficient smoking cessation is recommended since sodium uh, seems to play a major role in the fluid retention with the inner ear avoiding its salt is a paramount activity exercise is recommended in the moderation because of the unpredictable nature of the disease dangerous drugs especially the climbing ladder should be avoided well if we talk about the drugs the vestibular sedatives like the prochlorpyrazine the vasodilator bisdrahistrine and a diuretic for somite can be given intratympanic gentamicin gentamicin is preferred because it is more vestibular selective many methods of delivery exist like the injection gel foam pacemaker and the microwave multiple dosing schedules have been proposed low dose weekly multiple daily continuous and titration higher doses destroy the hair cells of the cochlea then comes a minute device the intratympanic the transtympanic micropressure treatment the fda approved in 1999 as a class 2 device treatment is self administered tid each treat, uh, the each treatment is 1 minute cycle applies intermittent alternating pressure of 0 to 20 cm of water well the minute this is delivers a pulse of pressure to the inner ear via the trans uh, that by the tympanos uh, tympanostomy tube some patients have symptomatic relief when the device is used on a daily basis due to the redistribution of the endolymph well now comes the surgical procedure these are the conserv uh, conservative procedures and the destructive procedures well in the conservative procedures the non destructive surgical procedure they is a, they is a directed towards the improving the state of the inner ear they are less invasive than the destructive procedures the four uh, the four most generally accepted management options are the endolymphatic sac compression the endolymphatic sac shunt the vestibular nerve section the fixed operation when the end in the endolymphatic sac decompression the endolymphatic sac produces uh, the procedure decreases the endolymphatic the endolymph pressure accumulation by removing the pectoris bone which increases the endolymph reservoir so what happens the endolymphatic sac procedure what happens in this decompression the endolymph pressure accumulation by uh, is decreased by by removing the pectoris bone which increases the endolymph reservoir this procedure allows the reservoir sac to expand more freely thus uh, dissipating the pressure so basically the pectoris bone is removed and the pressure is released now the endolymphatic sac shunt a drain or a wall from the endolymphatic space to either the mastoid or the subarachnoid space can be inserted as another means of further reducing the pressure success rate in terms of the controlling vertigo and stabilizing the hereditary the hearing equity with this procedure are reported at 6 to 80% now comes the vestibular nerve section the vestibular nerve is approached by the middle cranial fossa approach and nerve section it controls the vertigo and preserves the hearing now fix operation it is the uh, it is puncturing the saccule with a micro needle through the uh, stapes foot plate so what is a destructive procedure the destructive procedure of the inner ear 
एंड ओ द वेस्टुलर नर्व प्रिवेंट्स दीज एबनॉर्मल सिग्नल एज लॉन्ग एज अपोजिट इनर ईयर और द वेस्टुलर एपरेटिस फंक्शन नॉर्मली द ब्रेन इवेंचुअली विल कंपनसेट फॉर द लॉस ऑफ द लेबरन सो मेन थिंग इज द अदर शुड ईयर शुड बी नॉर्मल डिस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ द वन ईयर वन इनर ईयर डिपेंड्स ऑन द एडुकेट फंक्शन ऑफ द अपोजिट ईयर Unfortunately, Meniere disease can be bilateral in 70 to 50 percent. In which case, the method is contraindicated. So, what is the labyrinthectomy? The labyrinthectomy can be performed by either a transcanal approach or a basic mastoidectomy approach. In the transcanal approach, proceeds through the external ear canal. First, the tympanometer flap is elevated. Next, the right angle pick is inserted through the oval window, and the maneuver so as to disrupt the and scramble the nerve tissue of the labyrinth. This is a transcanal approach. And second is the basic mastoidectomy approach, which involves the extending the mastoidectomy by drilling through the semicircular canals. This allows more complete ablation of the labyrinth. Neuroepithelium then uh, can be achieved by the transcanal approach. Thank you this is all about the menial disease see you in the next lecture